Welcome to the Elliot Hulse Podcast. Podcast. I am the king of making men strong. Shedding of the old man, right? The way we can freely walk into rising, ascending, cleansing, sanctifying our soul for it's the Yo Elliot God. Show. I like that. Yo, bros, we're back with the Yo Elliot Show or the Elliot Hulse Show or I don't know. We'll figure it out as we go along. But it's my show and you're here because you want to hear me talk about some stuff. We've been talking about some really cool stuff over the past few weeks. And I want to keep diving deeper into this amazing stuff that helps you become a stronger version of yourself. Making men strong again here in this degenerate age. And so we have been kind of dabbling with the dichotomy between the two ways a man can be. And so we've been talking about initiation, going from one way of being a man into, uh, or better yet, going from being a boy or a boyish man into a man and a manly man and a man with dignity and integrity and purpose and focus and mission and vision and drive because he knows who he is and he knows what's expected of him. He has all of the authority and he takes tremendous responsibility in his life. And so, but like, this is a conversation that can last for eternity. It, there's so much to unpack. And so I'm grateful for the fact that we can speak to it in this dichotomous way, right? The, the before being a fully integrated masculine man and what it looks like to be a fully integrated masculine man. But because it's a spectrum, we're always moving. We're always moving from lesser, weaker versions of ourselves to greater, stronger versions of ourselves, more holy versions of ourselves, right? And so this is an ongoing thing. It, the work is never done, right? You're never fully the strongest version of yourself, I guess, maybe until you die, right? Because as long as we're living in these flesh suits, we have resistance, and so it makes it tough. Uh, we've got sin, weight, you know, the heaviness of life. Uh, but I guess when we shed these bodies, if we have really uh, purged our souls of weakness, effeminacy, and sin, then uh, some people believe that you merge with God. And you call those people saints. Those who you know are in heaven, right? At one with the Father. And so we've even used that term, atonement with the father which means at one minute with the father and so this is the perfection that we're aiming for as men my mission hasn't changed one bit it is to be the strongest version of ourselves but the rabbit hole goes deep now last week i said that we would this week begin the approach towards atonement well i as is typically the case was a little ahead of myself i definitely get ahead of myself sometimes and so I intend for this podcast to uh, go on, so I'm going to take my time. I don't need to get to the get to the peak just yet, right? You don't want to be a premature ejaculator, right? I have a tendency to do that sometimes. So I want to slow it down and stroke you a little bit, and that means that we need to spend some more time, a lot more time, on well, what it looks like to be in the state of disintegration, our, a weaker version of ourselves, really identify what that looks like objectively and subjectively, uh, and then also the processes by which we purge ourselves of that sin, that darkness, right? Um, I, unlike some Christians, don't believe, I don't believe that we just... Uh, when we accept Jesus Christ into our life, we're infused with grace, and then that's it. There's no more work to be done. Uh, that doesn't even make sense. <laughs> we're always working. We're working with the grace of God. Uh, but at the same time, we got to move our feet, right? You can pray all you want, but you got to move your feet. We're, we're, we're co-creators. God makes, he builds his kingdom through human hands, right? That's what his plan was. And so we got to do stuff, fellas. There are things that we get to do, but for today, we're going to talk about 
who we are so that and, and, and where we are in our fallenness so that we know what to do specifically for you. We're all very different. There are things that I've mastered that I don't need to really focus too much on, but there are things that I'm very weak at that require vigilance for me to overcome and to be triumphant. And I'm sure the same is for you. Where I'm strong, you may be weak, and where you strong, I might be weak. So if we're going to be doing battle, bros, we ought to know who we are in our weakest version. In other words, assessing our state, being realistic about what we struggle with. And, you know, I don't like to dive too much into the why. Why could be a mind trap. Why is totally a mind trap? Why did this happen to me? And then it usually begins with blame. Oh, mommy did this, daddy did that. But you know what? It's all been God's plan. So the why isn't so important, but it is fascinating to know. It's entertaining. It gives us some perspective, but it's not because we can go and fix those things. We can only work on ourselves. And so what does that look like in terms of diagnosis, if you will? I, a better way to say it is assessment, right? I'm not a doctor. I don't diagnose, but I'm a man with discernment, and I assess. I look and see. Hmm, there are patterns. Really, assessment is pattern recognition. That's all it is. Recognizing certain patterns and then being able to not predict but project what might be as a result. And so when we... We could even go, we could, we could reverse engineer it. Look at the result, what's going on in your life, and then work our way back to through the pattern. And we could even find the trauma at which it started, but it really doesn't matter because all that matters is what's here and now, right here today, and what we have control over. So don't, diagnosis can become a religion too. You know, we can get very, this is where those who are into horoscopes get duped, right? Reading these things, look, they're forbidden, but they'll only make a mess of you if you believe that it's true, right? There's a good reason why it's forbidden. It's been forbidden by the church because these modes of assessment give us a false sense of power and ownership over God's creation. Oh, I know what's going to happen because of what God creation is telling me. Well, there are patterns there. There's an essence there, but pure truth only is poured through God's plan, right? So... You never really can nail anything down. So that's kind of my caveat here with this too. I speak in terms of archetypes. We talk about the thinking, feeling, being, and doing aspect of a man, his king, warrior, magician, and lover, uh, which is important but not entirely true. It gives us a sense of things. You can get a little bit more complicated with it in terms of uh, these – I don't know what the term would be, but, you know, ENFP personality types, right? That's what that's what I – was at one point. I don't know. I think it might change. And we're going to talk about change too in terms of these diagnoses. But, you know, you take a test and you come out to be a personality type. Well, that's helpful for having a sense of yourself so that you can be grateful for the things that are good and work on the things that suck, right? It's just, it's like looking in the mirror, you get, an, you get an objective viewpoint, but it's not who you really are. You're not really that. I'm not really an ENFP. <laughs> it's a, it gives a sense of pattern in my life and so and i say this for you too whatever your personality letter type is don't get too attached to it it's a helpful tool it gives you a sense but it's not really who you are bro right i'm not really an aries right i got a lot of i got a lot of aries tendencies there's patterns there but i would never identify as that's me and so my fate is sealed so this is where this might be referred to as esoteric, but it really isn't because with Google, nothing's esoteric anymore. Nothing's secret anymore. Um, occult, that's the word I was looking for, not even esoteric. Anyway, it was the wrong tune for, term for sure. Uh, occult, occult, occult stuff. This could be considered occult stuff, but occult st stuff means like eye covered. That's what occult, like uh, ocular comes from, means hidden, hidden stuff. That's not hidden. A lot of stuff's not hidden. What's hidden is people's uh, uh, is people's relationship to them, and they blind. They get blind. I call they get blind by stuff and think it's true. So anyway, little caveat because I know that there are people that will or that may be listening to me or they're going to hear some of the things I'm saying, um, and you know think that I'm trying to spread error. Well, that's not the case at all. 
It's about recognizing God's patterns. These patterns are real. They're, 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 the patterns are real, but you can't predict or nail anything down because we're not God. We don't know. So I have, a, I have another caveat. Um, the man whom which I discovered, or, or, or better yet, the, the man who discovered, and then through the work of others, I came to n discover that he discovered the things I'm going to be talking about right now, um, in a lot of ways isn't a good man. He was one of Sigmund Freud's students by the name of Wilhelm Reich. Uh, he did some evil things, that, uh, namely the provocation of women in order to create the sexual revolution. He discovered things about the body and sexual energy. And what I'm going to talk to you about here today, which uh, could be considered bioenergy, that's what uh, Alexander Lowen called it, who's closer to my teacher. Uh, but uh, um, Reich called it um, orgone, orgone, almost where you almost get the word orgasm too. And he called these orgastic reflexes because it's energy moving in the body or how the energy gets stuck in the body, sexual energy. He called it orgasm energy, orgone energy. Orgone, orgasm energy is when it's most fluid and, and, and free in a body is recognized in a baby. A baby has the orgone is moving freely through it. And the orgone, just like sex, you know, follow me. Hey, if anything, if nothing else, this is entertaining to you. Just be entertained by the things I'm saying. But you might glean a thing or two also. also. So if you, you know that the sexual act looks like this. There, there's a waving of the body. The sexual act is, is almost a jarring forward or jarring out of the natural subtle energy that wants to move in a body while it's breathing. So orgasm and breathing are synonymous. When you look at a baby breathe, there's a there's a wave like pattern, right? Looks look, look, it looks like I'm doing right now. I look like I'm one of those black girls in the in the movies or the uh, uh, the videos dancing, right? Doing twerks or some shit like that because it's sexual movement. It's sexual movement. That sexual movement is also the move the natural movement of breathing. If you look at a baby, there's a, there's a extension at the cervical spine followed by a flexion and then an extension at the um, thoracic spine, and then finally all the, all the way down to the bottom. Uh, one of the things that I became popular for saying is breathe into your balls. That's what it literally means to breathe into your balls, to have a full full breath wave, orgastic wave, way down into your pelvic floor. Not an easy thing to do in a world that keeps us cramped in chairs like I am right now. Carlos, I'm going to have to get one of these chairs that don't have arms soon. Yeah, I like the man spread. But that's kind of locking up my... Uh, that's locking up my sexual energy, right? Because there's there's a lack of there's a lack of movement possible as a result. Uh, sitting at think about this one, looking at the screens all day long. So if we're to be, if if, if the perfect strongest version of ourselves, the purest version of ourselves, the most untraumatized, uh, perfect image of God version of ourselves, that's free from neurotic holding patterns, and, I call, and that's a term that I've used before, but just think about the word holding patterns. Me sitting here for the next hour or so is gonna create a holding pattern, right? Short hip flexors, uh, uh, sh shortened, um, what do you call this? The rectus abdominis, upper abdominals, because I'm slouching a little bit. Shoulders pinched up, posture. Muscular imbalances, posture. If you have, if, if, if the most pure, expression of orgone energy, life force energy, the Holy Spirit. I don't know how you, you know, you can religify these, these terms, but they're scientific too, right? The, you, 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 can, you can look into new science that shows this stuff. Uh, sometimes we get superstitious and, and, and if we could just boil things down to just simple breathing and moving, uh, I don't have to call it any fancy esoteric or occult word. It's, I don't have to call it kundalini. It's literally just movement and breathing in the body and the freedom or the locking up of it, right? So anyway, that's my little rant on that. Think sometimes. 
let's be, let's be objective. That's a big part of what we're, what we're trying to do here to remove ourselves from this addiction to mommy and the matrix. And that has a lot, you know, that's, that's, that's a rabbit hole itself too. So let me stop. Let me come back home. And so Wilhelm Reich. So what he discovered was that when he would work with his patients, he was a student of Freud, so they did a lot of talk therapy. He would, what would happen is the patient would lay on the bed and the, and the psychotherapist would sit behind the patient and ask questions into the person's head and they would be laying there. Now, traditionally, it was, a, it, was a, it was totally a talk thing. Freud would sit and don't talk and they have conversations. And it they would go down some deep rabbit holes and maybe things were brought up. And maybe things were re-experienced. Maybe confessions were made during this sort of uh, ape of the confessional, the Catholic confessional. You can't see the psychotherapist. You can't see the priest, right? So it's, it's a hijacking and perversion of the sacrament of reconciliation. And if you, if you look into the work of E. Michael Jones in Degenerate Moderns, he calls out Freud on a lot of that, right? As, as the church was being subverted and destroyed, they were basically uh, hijacking its sacraments and trying to medicalize it, one of which is psychotherapy. That's why it's a soft science. Psychotherapy is not a real science. Psychologists are not real scientists. They're, they're more like fake priests, secular priests. Anyway, Wilhelm Reich, one of his students, began to leer over the chair and look at his patient's body when they were breathing. So, you know, maybe he was a, a ECAM voyeur before that was a real thing. He wanted to see the movement in the body when he's talking to this person. And so he began to observe the herky-jerky, disintegrated movements uh, particularly as it related to breathing that would happen when people would re-experience traumas. You're having a particular conversation about something that's uncomfortable and then all of a sudden the face turns pale or the face turns red or the jaw start, the person's not speaking with as much, um, um, what would you call it, look, look, movement in the mouth. It gets a little bit more tight jawed, right? or their fists start to boil up, or their, the freedom of their breathing, because ultimately all of these physical movements or, or tensions are designed to suffocate us. They stop breathing because, well, as a primal response to threats, we stop breathing, right? If you're in a threatening situation where a tiger might be sniffing you out, you're not going to be breathing like... <gasps> You're going to literally have to stifle your breathing. So based on perceived threats, we modify our breathing. And that always happens through movement, tension in the body, muscles, in the throat, in the face, in the hands, in the eyes, and the ears. Hope you guys are following me. So he would look over the counter and he would start to, or look over the couch and he'd start to notice these different subtle movements and, uh, and, and breakups in the breathing of his patients. And as a pattern recognizing scientist that he was, I'm not going to go into the bad things he did um, because there's lots of different opinions on this guy. He's probably one of the most fascinating characters of the 20th century. You should really look him up. I mean, he, but anyway, there are a lot of things he didn't he did that I didn't like. But I'm talking about all the stuff that he did. That I think is brilliant. He probably sh he should have stuck with. He bounced from this and started going other places. Uh, but with the patients that started that he started to notice this movement in the body he started to recognize patterns and these patterns he he tied them to each of the psychopathologies as presented by freud based on conversation he started to notice that the the, the diagnosis of the psychopathology based on this person's character Right? Their psychological predisposition also mirrored itself in their structure. He discovered something that's called character structure. Basically, you look like your psychopathology. And we all got psychopathological problems. I'm not saying you're all psychopaths or psychopaths, but, but brain problems, mind problems, soul 
problems is really what it boils down to, feelings and thoughts. They're soul problems. We live in a society that, that perpetuates that. And even in the name of freedom, we pervert it even more. It's crazy. Sexual, sexual liberty is soul slavery. And you, can, and you see it in the bodies of perverted people. <laughs> right? How is it that that's a man, but he switches his hips like a girl? You ever notice? There's some guys that are you know, flaming homosexuals that, how are you just walking like that? They don't even know they're doing it. It's totally subconscious. It's like a demon of sorts. There's a spirit in that person. And what Reich began to notice is that spirit shows itself in the body. Character structure. So I'm going to take a pause there. I'm going to drink some water because now you're probably going to start asking yourself, well, what does my character structure say about me? And that's when I dive into the importance of conversations like this when it comes to ratifying ourselves of our weaknesses. It's not about knowing this character structure so that you can fix it or do something or have some feeling or hang up about it. Judgment? It's not about that at all. It's about the power of knowing yourself so that you can do the best you can with what you got. It it's, should be a positive, aff, affirmative, it's an affirmative understanding because it gives you understanding of self. Right? And you don't want to be ignorant of yourself. That's, you know, I think Jesus says that my people suffer for they, they do not know. They don't know. They don't even know themselves. Most people don't even know themselves. They're just a conglomeration of the TikToks and memes that they read all day. They talk and act like a freaking TikTok. So character structure. Before I go any further, I just want you to understand that this character structure emerges based on the experiences that the very ten, what you said, call it malleable young body experiences, namely from conception to age between four and twelve. You know, it's 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 in that very malleable phase of your life birth to 12, right? You're still a child, you're a baby. You start getting really structured after six, seven, eight, nine, you're like, yeah, you're pretty much who you are at that, at that point. But I just kind of leave room for space because there could be traumas that come in at any time. At nine years old, boom, you know, your parents separate, your dad leaves, you never see him again. Well, that's a trauma and you're still very moldable in psych and body. So I cap it at 12, but you know a lot of the things that I'm going to be talking about right now happen at a very the, the most vulnerable stages of our lives. And, um, and they form these different, I'm going to describe four character structures. Interesting that number four too. Uh, and, and Reich and, and, Lo, and Lowen both taught that there were five, but I have different opinion about that, you know. <laughs> Who am I, right? All right, these guys wrote the book. They're the doctors, but um, I don't. I, I I'll come back to the fifth. Let me put it that way. At another time. But um, these four character structures emerge based on experience that the person has in the in four different age stages. So let me let me tell you the name of the character structures. I'll tell you, and then I'll go back. I'm going to work it. I'm going to work with it that way. So you have schizoid, and I'll also tell you what this person looks like because it'd be very fascinating if you could. If I pulled up a card and you could see the picture of a schizoid, you'd start being able to identify yourself almost right away. But I'll describe them here: schizoid, thin body, uh, head is very active, thinking, creative people, um, but the eyes may may. Um, belie that may uh, betray that right so skinny body energy drawn up into the head not very uh maybe animated or embodied but very calculative and very imaginative and very heady and so the body looks that way 
You know these people. You know the guy, uh, I think the best example, I'm going to get his name wrong, is it Stephen Hawking's? Who's the Hawking's that he was literally crumpled up in a chair with his head cocked this way, but he's considered you know, one of the most brilliant men in the world? He's not brilliant He because you can't be because you need intelligence to be brilliant and intelligence requires attachment to the body. He's a perverted version of intelligence, which is all head, pure schizoid. When I talk about schizoids, these people look normal. You wouldn't, you'd have to start looking with your own eye. Like, okay, yeah, I see. Yeah, real thin joints, real almost look disjointed and and gauntly sometimes. Um, And then, you know, very thinking, like their mind is spinning. They've got a million stories going on in their head. But just, but the most extreme example, man, I can't, I have, it's just almost like comical is that dude in the wheelchair with his head cocked to the side, talking like this. He's just a pure brain. (laughs) Schizoid to death. So we have schizoid. Then we have oral. And so oral, they're most recognized by almost the slouching of their shoulder posture and the jutting out of their head. They're very talkative people and very friendly people. I'm not talking just about the negative sides of these people. Like I said, the schizoid is very intelligent. Oral, very friendly. Their arms almost look like they're reaching out. Uh, and and they like to eat, they like to put things in their mouth. You might catch them putting things in their mouth like this. Um, they're usually in movies sort of like the, I don't want to say the, they're usually the heartthrob in a boyish way. Um, Justin Bieber, very oral. Um, just think about what he does with his mouth. He makes music with his mouth. He loves with his mouth. That's oral. Um, and so we'll go back and we'll talk more about that. But you can see this person, they usually also have very weak legs. Um, either uh, hyperextended knees or very thin legs. It almost looks like they can't stand on their own legs. They, and that's why the arms are about, they, they're, they're reachers. And so they hang on other people. They get, there are a lot of them you, that you would say they're extroverts because they get their energy from other people. Then you have masochist. Um, masochist in the movies are often the fat guy, fat funny guy is a masochist. The masochist is one that uh, keeps a lot of energy in and so builds up this way. So usually thick, short, blocky looking people, a lot like me. My mother is a pure masochist. (laughs) If you ever get to see my mom, even her neck has gotten shorter and shorter over the years because there's a, there's a clamping down at the throat and at the, at the pelvis. And so they'll even look like, you know, look like a square little blocky person. But a lot of times they'll have a small butt that almost tucks under. And it's because they're clenching. There's a clenching down at the anus and at the throat. Where orals are like a wide open, masochists are, there could be a closing. But, you know, there's an opening and a closing. And so one of the things that you'll notice about masochists is that they can come out, but then there's guilt and shame. A lot of that going on. There's a lot of guilt and shame. Uh, and then you have psychopath. I got a lot of psychopath. Psychopaths are a lot of, they're very animated. A lot of energy drawn up into the shoulders, into the eyes, and into the mouth. Um, very charismatic people. Uh, a lot of times the body is built like a V. So usually a lot of muscle. Um, but also you'll get this when it's very exaggerated. It's very thin waist small you know like the 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 meme right of the the guy with the big upper body and the small legs there's a tendency towards that with the more psychopath um character structure now these are you might read different definitions in the dictionary i'm basing this off of wilhelm reich's character structure and what i know from the study and the i i did three years of therapy i guess you could call it um but it was so much more. I, and this is this. I'm sure this will be a recurring topic for us. This whole idea of bioenergetics. <sighs> I can go on and on because I'm. I see a lot of it even in the churches, especially those the Pentecostals. There's something that they understand, but maybe in a different way, about the soul and the body, and that there needs to be a you know the charismatic movement in the Catholic Church. It's charisma. It's charisma. It's this you know getting out of the way and letting God's stuff, which when I say God's stuff, I don't think it's all good. Demonic stuff can be in there too. 
spirit stuff is probably a better way to put it. Spirit stuff work its way out. And a lot of some of it's joyful. My first experience with this was joy, tremendous pleasure and joy. Uh, but I've also had sorrow. And so these are these are what Wilhelm Reich would describe as the trapping of emotion in the prison of the body or neurotic holding patterns. They're 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 nervous system holding patterns. And so, for example, what the so going down. So first of all, think for yourself which one of those you resonate most with. Not that it's you, but like I said, I've I and I think it's a spectrum too. I know it's a spectrum too. It's a spectrum based on age and it's a, ba it's a spectrum based on how the energy moves in the body. So I said earlier that, you know, I'm kind of a masochist. My mom's a masochist. My dad's a psychopath. Um, a lot of both. You see what I'm saying? So these are psychological predispositions based on learned behavior. It's also based on your genetics. I'm built this way not because I... I worked hard in the gym, but I didn't choose this body to be, you know, strong and powerful and thick and muscular like I am. I that was that's a gift that came from my parents. But with every gift comes a curse too. So I'm a masochist, but I'm built like a brick house, <laughs> right? And I think my mom I also got my pretty face from my mom. My dad's not a bad looking guy either. So the character structure is not just based on trauma, though I'm going to talk about those traumas in a moment now because, I'm going to, because there's a way that these emerge most intensely. So I do believe that there's a uh, genetic predisposition to these structures. There's also nurture, right? Isn't that the age-old debate, nature versus nurture? nurture? Well, it's both, right? Because God is a spectrum, spirit and What's here? Flesh, right? Most, ex most perfect example is in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ m glorifies creation because God became man. It's the perfect spectrum. He is God, you see? So we can't hate the body. We can't ignore the body. We can't, uh, you know, make the body an idol either. The body is, is, is integral to God's expression, God's, God's doing God's thing as a spirit. It's just that the, the, the body's temporary. The spirit, your soul is eternal. So let's talk about the traumas, though, that are associated, or the experiences. I say trauma because, you know, that's a, that's a word people like to use these days. But let's talk about the experiences associated with how these four character structures emerge. And, and I, I guess I have to come back because we've been talking for over 30 minutes. I got to come back and remind you why we're doing this. I can get lost in the minutia of these things too because they're fascinating ideas and I love all this stuff. Like I said in a different show, I'm a dilettante of sorts. I love these ideas. But we don't want to lose sight of what we're doing, right? Like why do I want to know all this stuff? Well, number one, knowledge of self is, is a helpful map. It's not the total truth about yourself, but it gives you an idea of your tendencies, your patterns, and things you should be vigilant against, and things that you should be grateful for, but not to become proud of, you see. So it's, it's an objective view of ourselves, which is critical for personal growth, right? If you, you say what, what matter in business they say what you measure grows, right? What you have a bead on, you can work with. If you don't know the bottom line in your business, it's going to be very hard to make financial decisions. <laughs> you don't know who yourself is. You're going to have very difficult decisions making about, uh, you know, your path in life. You don't know yourself. But why are we talking about this now? So that we can get all this stuff out the way and clean our slate and be ready for the imprint of the Lord becoming kingdom citizens. The truest most holiest, strongest version of ourselves. We have to be, we have to, in my opinion, we have to navigate our territory. We've got to know our territory well so that we can be vigilant against its degradation, be vigilant against our, our tendency towards sin, our fallen nature. We want to master it. And so this is a, this is a, 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 a means of mastery, self-mastery.
I did a survey the other day and I asked guys, what out of these four things, what were you most interested in, uh, you know, succeeding in your life? Fitness, females, finances, self-mastery. Overwhelming majority chose self-mastery. I was shocked. I was like, wow, it doesn't, what does that even mean? But there's something men understand and that is we can have mastery over ourselves and we should over our passions, right? Our weaknesses. So that's why we're doing this. And how do these character structures come about? Well, based on experiences uh, on in different stages of your growth, different stages, namely between the conception and we'll wrap up like around between age and f four and six. The schizoid, which we know a little bit about based on what I said before, um, has their positive and negative aspects. You know, I could probably do a whole show on each one of these and maybe I will. So let's keep it succinct. Between zero and conception, it means, I'm sorry, between conception and age one. And, and, and very shortly thereafter being out of the womb. Now this tells you something. If a psychopathology and character structure can form in a baby in a womb, and all those people who say that it's just a clump of cells, those people that say that, this refutes, this, this challenges their stupidity. I mean, we all know that's stupid. A baby's character structure begins forming in the womb based on these findings, right? And once again, I'm a dilettante. So you're going to argue with me, but go do your research. Don't expect me to go pull up, prove my point, right? It's entertainment, remember I told you? So a, a lot of times these types come about when there's famine or war in the mother's life. or So in other words, the stress of carrying the baby on top of the stress of living uh in famine, which then means, man, I'm an extra, the woman, think about the woman's mindset and there's famine, there's starvation. I am a burden to this family. Me and my baby are a burden and maybe un unwanted, right? Because I can't contribute. Imagine she's having this conversation. I'm big and I'm heavy and I need extra food. And oh, poor me, maybe I shouldn't, maybe I don't deserve as much food, right? What that does is it begins to create an existential or a mind body split inside the baby. That's why the schizoids so up in the head. Or war, fear, fear for my life. Me and my baby might not make it. There's war. Or drugs. I'm so spaced out and doped up all the time that I even forget that I'm pregnant. So there's a split in the mother that happens during her experience of being, being pregnant with this baby that will create that split in that baby's mind body that would lead to someone being more of a schizoid type unwanted baby is another one right the moment the mother already starts hating the baby don't want this baby that creates a split in the baby don't think it doesn't <laughs> right so those are some of the ways that this comes about it also can happen after coming out of the womb but this is closer to oral if the baby and the mother doesn't, don't have a connection, a warm connection, if the mother sees the baby as an object and doesn't have that warmth for the baby, that can, that's a part of the schizoid split, but that probably happened long ago anyway, nine months in the womb, baby already knows, this bitch don't want me. But then that closeness has a, is a stage of its own. The baby's outside the womb, and this is where the oral uh, character structure is developed. I hate that I even have to say traditionally, but humanely, basically meaning this is what humans do. And so we behave not like humans these days. But humans are supposed to nurse their young, <laughs> right? Go figure. Mamas are supposed to have the baby sucking on her tit. That's how the baby gets fed. The baby not only gets food from the mama, but she he also gets something physiologically satisfied by having skin-to-skin -skin contact. And if you ever watch a mama and her baby, nursing her baby, they look into each other's eyes. There's a love, 
This is why the oral is like a lover, I told you, like Justin Bieber. There's a love that can develop in a healthy or an unhealthy way. All of these splits, you know, there's healthy and unhealthy. The extremes are unhealthy. So the oral character will develop mainly from two types of splits. Either not enough mommy. Oh, let the baby cry it out. Oh, give the baby a bottle. I don't want my titty hurting in this baby mouth. She keep biting it. Oh, I got to get back to work. I can't be nursing this baby. Give her a bottle and a binky. Oh, breastfeeding is barbaric and uh, only them African ladies that walk around with their titties out do it. That's something That's something for savages, <laughs> right? This is how modern people think. They're so stupid. We're so smart, we're stupid. And if the baby don't get that, the baby does this. Ah, ah, it reaches. Look about, think about the oral character structure with the rounded back and the reaching out arms and the mouth wide open, always licking shit. Ah, ah. And they get stuck like that. <laughs> Isn't that funny? You know, when you, you're a kid, they used to say, if you make a face and they slap you in your back, you get stuck like that. Well, when the energy flows in the body in such an intense way, at such a malleable age, the body gets stuck like that. Isn't that crazy? It could also be too much baba. Well, I'm, I'm more familiar with that in my family. <laughs> we nursed all our kids. We still got some orals. <laughs> it's genetic too. My wife's oral. But too much gets attached to this. This is where you get just oh, too much mommy attachment. All your pleasure come from mommy. And so when you can't get mommy anymore, you're looking for what girl can I get this from? What drug can I get this from? I, you know, what video game can I get this from? I need this pleasure that comes from old mommy, right? So, you know, I'm just kind of, I'm pausing in my thought because I'm talking about this, you know, happening based on nurture versus nature, man. And I just, I spelled it out for myself. I don't even really even know. It's a, it's a combination of both. It can't not be. Like I said, my wife is my wife is oral. I am psychopath. I'm I, there's not a bit of oral in my entire family. Maybe there is a little bit. I'm exaggerating. I think my brother Ellis is a bit oral, but uh, my parents are psychopath and uh, and and, and uh, masochist. They're totally different type of character structure. My wife, she's oral, and two of my kids are they. It, all my kids have a have a taste of orality. But the ones that had the titty the most are really collapsed orals. You know, she gave more to them. The other two are a little bit more held up and they didn't get as much breast. So it could be too much. But it's the bottom line is it's something that happened in that stage that builds this character structure. Something to do with it. And 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 um genetics. Well, anyway, so that's my caveat. Entertainment, remember, I'm just saying to entertain you guys. This is fun stuff, right? Enjoy, you enjoying yourself? Cool. Don't take me too seriously. You got then, and so that's how that character structure is developed. And so that person, and so it would be good to go back to each one of these and talk about the sin, the the, the, the tendency towards uniquely their sins uh, so that you can see where you can improve, right? So like the oral, their sin is attachment and pleasure seeking and addiction to good feelings. These are these people become very promiscuous a lot of times until until it ruins their life. These are like addicted lovers. A lot of these most of these people these are ones that tend towards heavy addiction, you know. Uh you know who's a really good example of that Kurt Cobain. Total oral given to addiction, you know. So there's good things and there's bad things. These are the most friendly people. Orals, super friendly. Most of my best friends and the people I get along with best are orals. Orals and psychopaths love each other. <laughs> We're a good match, right? 
And so, you know, they love our energy and we love their adoration, right? right? So we kind of feed each other's egos. The masochist develops around the time that, so I already taught you what that body looks like. It's a short, thick, uh, energy clenched at the butthole in the throat. Um, this person, their their personality type uh, tends towards um, bouts of extroversion and or or explosion and then guilt expression and then repression um they can never really get things going because they minute they reach out they pull back and that's why the body gets thick because the energy never actually gets a chance to throw itself out either through the throat or through the butthole and you're going to see what i'm saying in a moment here because there could be a clenching of different diaphragms and sphincters internally that that develop this character structure. When you I say the muscular system, you automatically we think like, oh, neurotic holding patterns in the arms and you know we, the muscles we see. No, we got muscles in our throat. We got muscles from the rooter to the tutor. Right? The whole alimentary canal. And think about your diaphragm, right? The muscle that draws your breath in. You lose it, you die. So the masochist is, is, like I said, short, thick, you, sometimes very funny, very funny people, friendly people also as well. Uh, so there's good things and there's bad things, but how did this happen? How did you become a masochist? At about uh, age three, potty training age, potty training age is all about autonomy and it's about bodily autonomy. And so around that age, you're expected to sort of start eating for yourself, you know, picking up a spoon and eat and just put food in front of you and you, you deal with it. Um, which is a level of autonomy, or in, or that could be infringed upon too, as well as potty training, when you're going to shit and when you're not going to shit. Okay, we got to get you out of these diapers. Mommy's got to go back to work. You can't go shitting yourself at the daycare, right? Whatever. So the autonomy gets challenged. Well, I can't eat and shit whenever I want. That's why the closure at the throat and at the butthole. And so... The, 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 what would be the natural way, you know, for, in other words, in the most resourceful way for that individual, because we're all very different, you know, there's, there's no hard line rules, but allowing that person to evolve in the autonomy of what they put in their mouth and how they let it come out their ass comes into play. And so you have different scenarios. Force feeding a kid to eat when it doesn't want to eat something, uh, can create a closure in the throat. And so that that creates a lack of expression. All my expression right here is through my throat. When I'm being a masochist, my, my pitch of my voice goes up higher. That's the masochist coming out in me. If you watch videos from like 2009 on my YouTube channel, my voice it pitch is very high because I was, I was unaware of what I was doing. I hold a lot of tension in my throat. Now it's because my mom was stuffing food down my throat. I don't know. <laughs> I might have just got it from her because she got it. Well, who knows? But I know this about myself. And so even as I'm doing right now, because we're talking about it, I make a conscious effort to keep my throat relaxed when I'm talking because I could, I could flow more easily. That's a big part of it. Mama's got to go back to work, so you got to stop pooping yourself. And so then in shame, this, this person is, go, is colored by shame and guilt. For and, and and about normal things because it's all about their autonomy. Like my mom never liked to speak up because as a kid she lived she had to walk on eggshells, and so she never she never sp spoke up. And then so as an adult she feels she, that comes up because if she's in a circumstance where she needs to speak up sometimes she feels bad like oh I shouldn't say something. Right, that's what a masochist will do. They'll boil on the inside before they say something. If they're not expressing themselves true, that means clear that throat and say something, bro. So there's that, but then there's also, hey, am I allowed to go? Am I allowed to go now? And so the butthole muscles start getting spastic <laughs> as a result. So you get a masochist type. And finally, the psychopath is the best way I could describe this, but it's not always the case. Everything, here, nothing here is cut and dry is a boy who becomes a son husband. Meaning that, I don't know how much this is true, but this is based on what I've learned from Lowen and Reich. But 
The mother built seducing the child or the parent of the opposite sex seducing the child, not in a seductive sexual way, but in trying to build them up to be something maybe that their spouse isn't. My boy is going to be the greatest X, Y, Z. I can't wait till you could take care of your mama with all the money you're going to make as a ABC. You know, your daddy never did ABC very good. I hope you can do that. You see what I'm saying? So a sort of grandiosity, but a ungrounded grandiosity because it cannot be, it can't be uh, experienced. It can't be realized in that moment. So there's a guilt also associated with it. But there's there's a there's a inflation of this, the upper body, the head, gas. You ever hear say somebody got gassed? <laughs> Your mama's gassing you. Your daddy's gassing you. You got a lot of psychopath, uh, psychopath type women, uh, which are which are a little different, but the same as well. I I I would venture to say that most women today's general tendency is towards this form of psychopathy. The psychopaths and a lot of narcissism. I'm not saying it in a knocking way. I'm talking about this is just the way our culture is trained. I'll say for one thing, there's not a single person, that's, not a single man that's not a phallic narcissist. If you got an iPhone and you're looking at yourself, you staring at Narcissus Lake, his, it, the, the pond that he caught himself in. That's where the word come from, your iPhone, <laughs> right? So we all narcissists and because of it's the, it's the menu of the day. We all are our own gods, right? If you're American, you can't not think that you should be free and sovereign over your own life. And the, f the First Amendment means you should be able to say and do absolutely anything you want. There's this sense of, I'm God. And, uh, you know, my freedom, my rights, right? That's a, that's a narcissistic way. That's a disordered way of looking at life because there's no authority. And that's part of the reason why masculinity is what it is today too because men don't know how to take authority because we don't we don't know we don't know how to receive authority we, we, we have no god you have no head and so anyway so there's there's there, there's there's these archetypes in the zeitgeist too meaning it's um in the collective unconscious it's in the collective and so psychopaths are very good leaders they're great leaders, uh, they're great entertainers, they're very charismatic, um, great seducers. And I say great because, you know, maybe there's something to it, but also, you know, they can, they can seduce people in bad ways because they're so charismatic because they have this charisma, they have this energy. And we, because I identify as a psychopath, I have the character structure and I can identify with myself. We've got very strong, uh, because we're gassed up, very strong heads and can literally bend reality or want to bend reality to our wish. And that's why you get a lot of politicians. Most politicians are psychopaths. <laughs> they want to bend reality to their mind and you know they're willing to do it. Very ambitious people. Um, but could be also very dangerous. So I think we're coming up on time here. Yeah, we are. I tell you what, maybe I'll take some feedback from you. You watching this video and you want me to go deeper into character structure because it's really ultimately, like I said, all about eliminating sin. There's choices we can make by receiving the grace from God above, but this is about knowing ourselves so that we can be vigilant against the demons and our darkest self leading us down degenerate paths. And so it's an assessment of sorts. It's having fun. I know that Thomas Aquinas would speak about the four temperaments. I don't think it's very different except it's much more tangible. There are people who think they're a temperament. <laughs> oh, I could take a test. No, I'm looking at you. You are a masochist. Get it? Just look at your body. How it shows up in your character? Well, it depends on the state of your soul, how you choose to roll. And that means we got a choice. So if you guys tell me you want to hear more about this, maybe what I'll do is I'll dedicate a session to each one of those go deeper into uh, what it is but then how you can as one of my teachers say you can't change the house but you can make it more livable i kind of agree 
I think you can change the house to a degree. But really, making it more livable is about what? It's your soul. That's what's living in there. So it's about becoming your most holy self. So I could talk about those uh, or not. You guys let me know. If you say you want to roll, you get old Uncle Yo, and I'll be willing to do it. Uh, otherwise, there's so much that we can explore in terms of, I got to come up with a good term that's mine. I don't want to keep using this term, uh, you know, moving from the world of the mother, but this, um, this shedding of the old man, right? That way we can freely walk into rising, ascending, cleansing, sanctifying our souls for the big bro upstairs, God, God the Father, atonement with the Father. That's really what it is. I like that though, atonement with the Father. I might just keep using that term, atonement with the Father, becoming citizens of the Father's kingdom. Yes, brother. We can go there too. All right, cool. Well, that's it. That's all. Talk to you all next time. Done.